Okay, well, now that most of us are here, I want to say hi. Uh, thank you for com coming and joining us today and welcome to the Silver City Museum where you can see, okay, so I'll admit it's a fake virtual background, but if I were standing outside, it would look about like this. Uh, I gave myself away, about like that. Uh, this is the Silver City Museum in Silver City, New Mexico. And we provide on a monthly basis programs like this, as well as others that are free of charge to the community and everybody out there in the world. So if you can, we do request a $5 donation or whatever you can give. Uh, the link to the website is www.silvercitymuseumsociety.org. And um, in case people that um, haven't met me before, my name is Erin Griffith, and I am the educator here at the museum, at the Silver City Museum. And um, we are very fortunate to have with us today, Mr. Stephen Fox. And Stephen is a renowned historian who studied at Brown, he got his PhD in history, and has been working as, well not working as, but he has been a freelance um, historian for several years with seven published books under his name and relatively recently in his career spring 2019 he published an article in the um, New Mexico Historical Review on some very in-depth research that he has done into what we call the Jaime Crow era of segregation and racism in Silver in Grant County New Mexico and this is some really fascinating stuff people a lot of a lot of people of, of many generations move to this area and really don't understand the, the history of this area and so many things that have happened and that have formed the community that we are today. And this includes even um, natives that may have been born here or Hispanic families that grew up. And what Stephen has done is really given us an insight into that heritage that might otherwise not exist through his hard work and and years of scholarly research and that is very much appreciated and i'm very happy to be able to have him with us today so thank you everybody for your patience for your time for your attention and without further ado mr stephen fox thank you good morning everybody my story today has three phases relative equality in the latter part of the 19th century worsening conditions over the first half of the 20th century, and then slow improvements since about 1950. Until recently, the accepted labels here in Grant County were Mexican and white. I'll be using those terms for most of this talk because those were the terms that people used in the times that I'm discussing. This is important. Grant County was settled later than most of New Mexico. Much of the land was not welcoming to farmers and ranchers. The Apache were especially unwelcoming. The first slide, please. So there was not much settlement till gold and silver strikes in 1860 and 1870. And it was essentially to come here and mine or to hope to get to rich, become rich. Silver City got its name because we briefly had a silver strike here. So there was not much settlement till those strikes. Then Mexicans came from the south and white people came from the north and east. Everybody arrived at the same time. That's very important. Instead of whites displacing Mexicans and taking over as they did in so much of New Mexico, here neither group dominated at first, at first. Silver City's first public school in 1874 was not segregated. Uh, Chihuahua Hill, south of Broadway, was soon known as a Mexican neighborhood, but anybody could live anywhere in town. There was no ethnic residential pattern at that time. The first Mexican town councilor was elected here in 1879. The first Mexican district attorney was appointed in 1889. Hotels, bars, restaurants, theaters were not segregated. After 1900, these fluid, open conditions that are so typical of a new frontier town when things are as yet largely undefined, 
those things became more defined and stratified. So as Silver City grew, it expanded in size and contracted in tolerance. That's the essential process that we see from 1900 on. A fateful change in mining methods took place from the old small scale pick and shovel and a burrow techniques that you see in this photograph here. The next slide, please. Yielded to large scale, capital intensive industrial open pit mining powered by steam engines and run by professional managers from elsewhere in the United States. The next slide. The key figure here was John M. Sully, S-U-L-L-Y. He created the towns, the mine, and the mill of Santa Rita and Hurley. Those are towns near Silver City here in Grant County. He ran those places, Santa Rita and Hurley, both the towns and the workplaces. He ran them in every detail until his death in 1933 and he imposed full ethnic segregation on Grant County. It had not existed here until he came to town. So if you're looking for a villain here, it is he. John Sully was from Massachusetts, my home state, for almost 20 years after graduating from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1888, he worked mining jobs around the country, notably 10 years in Alabama and Georgia. The historical moment really matters because that era, 1890 to 1910, was the most terrible time since slavery for blacks in the deep south. Hundreds of lynchings, nobody ever got punished for them. Complete segregation by law, not just by custom. Blacks were allowed no right to vote, to strive, to hope, to live. Sully, as a young man, spent 10 formative years there. He absorbed deep South attitudes about segregation and white supremacy, brought those attitudes to Grant County, and installed them in Santa Rita and Hurley. From the start in 1910, whites lived on the west side in Santa Rita. Mexicans lived on the east side in Mexican town. Next slide, please. Sully made a revealing choice for his top policeman. This is Jim Blair. He had spent his first 20 years in the old Confederacy, the states of the old Confederacy. His father had lost a leg fighting for the South in the Civil War. Jim Blair was from Belton, Texas, south of Waco, a very segregated place. So he was the right man for the job, I'm saying. On the job, he was a strict segregation enforcing Sully's orders. In private, he was an integrationist in that in 1912, he married a Mexican woman. They had five kids and lived in Mexican town. Segregation always had its hypocrisies, hypocrisies and paradoxes. For his white employees, Sully built and rented nice homes in nice neighborhoods. The Mexicans rented vacant lots in Mexican town and built their own very basic houses. Next slide. This is white Santa Rita in about 1940. Paved streets, substantial houses with electricity and indoor plumbing, comfort and tidiness. This is the home of, the next slide please, the home of a machinist and his family. Not someone in management, a machinist. Aaron, my screen has gone blank, are you there? Hello? I'm here. Uh, do you see, I, I don't see anything on my screen. Do you see the slide up? Everything's fine. Okay, all right. I'm at the home of a machinist and his family. Next slide, please. This is Mexican town in about 1916. Unpaved streets, shacks that were cold in the winter and no utilities no electricity, no running water, no wind or plumbing. The large building in the middle distance on the right is a bunkhouse for unmarried men, men with no families. On the hill at the back, the Catholic church, a major force in this community, those small black boxes are outhouses. The jobs were also segregated. Mexicans were the laborers, 
the hardest, dirtiest, lowest paid jobs at the mine. In 1916, a man started at $1.50 a day. Practically all the better jobs went to whites. Craftsmen, drillers, craneman, mechanics, foremen, managers, and so on. Mexicans were also paid less than whites for the same jobs. Uh, the next slide, please. Coming up, we have the Santa Rita Chino Club. Members only, and all the members were whites. It had pool tables, slot machines, a dance hall, bowling alley. The only Mexicans allowed in were the pin setters and the cleaning women. Next slide. Here's the movie theater. Mexicans sat on one side, whites sat on the other. Everything I've said about Santa Rita was also true of Hurley. They were run by the same people, John Sully and his associates. Next slide, please. This photo from about 1940 is a metaphor in a way. The town below and the company's smokestack towering overhead, spewing acrid yellow smoke from the smelter. The two sections of Hurley were connected by an underpass beneath the railroad track, locked at night to prevent mingling. Mexicans could use the town pool only on the days when it was drained and cleaned. Santa Rita and Hurley were the first two fully segregated towns in Grant County. And again, I wanna stress this point, this was done by outsiders, people not from Grant County. It wasn't the will of the people in Grant County that this happened. It came in because the mining companies came in and did what they wanted. As the biggest local enterprises, Santa Rita and Hurley were inevitably the elephant in any room. So their practices spread to other towns. For example, in 1915, five years after Santa Rita began, Silver City, Silver City opened its first segregated public school, the ironically named Lincoln School on Chihuahua Hill. Next photo, please. These two next pictures are from the 1920s. Look at those faces. The school was grades one through four. Some of the kids are obviously older than that because they started school later. But what strikes me, these are young kids, is that hardly anybody is smiling. These kids look so serious, subdued, grim, glum. Next photo, another class, the same joyless faces. The teacher doesn't look real delighted either. That's the angle woman you see off to the side. These pictures, you gotta be careful with photographic evidence, but I think they may tell us something about what it was like at the Lincoln School in the 20s. Next slide, please. Dennis Chavez, a United States Senator, was the most powerful Hispanic politician in the state from the 1930s into the 1950s. He helped lead a crusade to teach Spanish speaking students only in English. Bilingualism was unheard of. As part of this endeavor, essentially to wipe out the Spanish language in New Mexico, in 1941, the Silver City School Board, four white people, voted to stop teaching Spanish altogether. This local ban lasted about a dozen years, but efforts to prevent speaking Spanish in schools and workplaces lasted for decades and did not end, end really until rather recently. Come to me, please. Around 1950, the tide began to shift slowly. Some unrelated factors. First, veterans came back from the wars, World War II and Korea, exposed to a wider world, toughened by the experience and less inclined to accept mistreatment. Second, pressures from unions and federal regulators forced some improvements in working conditions at the mines. In particular, the mine mill and the steelworkers unions ended the dual wage system, as it was called, which paid Mexicans less than whites for the same jobs. I would emphasize that the free market by itself did not end the dual wage system. 
It took the unions and a certain amount of federal prodding to do it. Back to the slides, please. In 1955, Kennecott Copper sold the towns of Santa Rita and Hurley. It, it kept the, the mill and the mine. But uh, uh, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, the historical symmetry is striking here. Outsiders had imposed a full Heine Crow on this county. 50 years later, when the successors to those outsiders left, things started to improve. Isn't that remarkable? Because under local control and union pressure, some good changes were made. In Hurley, the schools, swimming pools, and changing rooms at the mill were integrated with no great commotion. Under Kennecott, there was no self-government in either Santa Rita or Hurley. The company ran everything. The first Hurley Town Council, elected in 1956, included two Mexican-Americans. The Supreme Court's Brown decision in 1954 mandated the end of segregated schools. It took five years, but in 1959, the Lincoln School was closed after 44 years of segregation. Ten years later, after that, the building got a kind of redemption as the home of El Grito Head Start here in Silver City. Next slide. At the Santa Rita mine, the diesel mechanics in the truck shop had always been white, all of them white. By 1967, after recent pressures from the feds and the unions, 58 of the 60 mechanics were Hispanic. It happened quick, quickly, just like that. These were all good changes. Uh, come to me, please. But on an everyday level, beyond the reach of unions and federal regulators, improvements came more slowly. In the 50s and 60s, Grant County remained quite segregated. Oral history, memory, is often unreliable. People tend to remember things as they wish they had been. Chuck Olson grew up in Santa Rita in these years, and he says that whites from that time don't recall any discrimination. But for Mexicans, those hard memories remain a hole in their hearts, as Chuck puts it. The Mexican version is confirmed by documentary evidence. The white version is not. Back to the slides. Now, new possibilities in these, in these years when things are starting to open up a bit. The career of Librado Maldonado illustrates some good changes. This is his high school senior picture. He is on the lower row on the left, Librado Maldonado. He grew up on Chihuahua Hill, the son of a miner. His mother, Monica, stressed education for her children. He goes to the Lincoln School in the 1940s. Uh, at the Central Junior High, the next step up, classes were still segregated and speaking Spanish was forbidden. At recess, the playground had an imaginary line down the middle. If your ball crossed that line, you couldn't go get it. A teacher had to retrieve it for you. The next. In high school, class of 1954, Librado was the only Hispanic among 15 members of the National Honor Society. Here he is in the center toward the bottom of the page. He also played tackle at 160 pounds on the football team. In the building that is now the grinder mill on College Avenue, the hut as it was called, was a popular after-school hangout with a jukebox and soda fountain. Kids would go there after class. No Mexicans allowed, not even a member of the National Honor Society and the football team. Librado had a notable career here as a teacher and principal at Cobre High in Bayard and as a town councilor and mayor of Silver City. He was often, as here, the only Hispanic in the room. A brief pause. I want to um, state again that I am using the terms Mexican and white because those were the generally accepted terms here until the late 20th century. So I'm using them because that's what people were saying at that time. So a tour of downtown Silver City in the 1950s and 60s. 
The Rainbow Cafe on Broadway was for Mexicans. It was run by the Wong family, one of the Chinese families who lived here in that time. The Silco Confectionery on Bullard was for whites. Next slide. El Sol Theater on Bullard showed mainly Mexican movies. The next, across the street, the Gila and Silco theaters showed Hollywood movies, white movies. Mexicans had a bar, the clubhouse, on Yankee Street. Whites drank the late lamented Buffalo Bar on Bullard. Mexicans faced a daily barrage of insults, large and small. For example, at the Silco, they sat upstairs on hard wooden seats while the whites sat downstairs on comfortable padded chairs. At the Hurley Company store, Mexican, Mexicans waited at the back of the line until all the white people were served first. A restaurant, now the site of the Billy Casper Center here, had a sign, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. Mexicans or dogs. In school, Gilbert Garcia remembers sitting at the back with the other Mexicans, raising his hand and being ignored. An elementary school teacher forced Maria Dominguez to eat soap for speaking Spanish. The tracking systems of those days put whites in the top classes and Mexicans in the bottom classes. It was apparently written in stone somewhere. The teachers were all white, and those teachers believed, in general, that Mexicans were just not smart. Guidance counselors in high school would encourage white boys to consider college and Mexican boys to enlist in the armed forces. This is heartbreaking. The little girl in Hurley, Delia Nanez, who loved to dance, Bright-eyed and eager, she went to sign up for a dance class and was told the class was full. Then a white girl came and got into the class. Dahlia went home in tears. How do you explain that to a child? She was eight years old. This routine, inescapable sense of being slighted, demeaned, diminished, just not good enough. Just not good enough, nope. If white people in positions of authority keep saying you're stupid, you may believe them. That's the danger. Come to me, please. In response to all this, the late 20th century saw two major episodes of angry Chicano protest in Grant County. Neither took place during the insurgent 1960s, which is a, kind of surprising. You'd think it would have happened then, but the county had long been dominated by the mining companies and conservative politics. And the ranchers out in the country around Silver City are also a fairly conservative bunch. So politically, the 60s never happened here. That took place about 20 years later. Back to the slides. The Brown Berets came to town for two weeks in the fall of 1971. No, uh, forward, there you go. They were a militant group from Southern California modeled on the Black Panthers with blazing rhetoric and furious opposition to the Vietnam War. The next, they were touring the Southwest that fall, hoping to start chapters outside California and they came to Grant County because of its Empire Zinc strike of 1950 to 52 later depicted in the film, Salt of the Earth. About 35 guys in all, many of them teenagers. The next, the Daily Press, our main local paper here, ran this front page photo of them marching down Bullard Street in military order with machetes. They stayed for a while at the CYO Hall that was uh, connected to the Catholic Church here, and then camped out on Chihuahua Hill and in Bayard, which is a nearby town. They held an initial rally here. A speaker said the local politicians were not truly representing Chicanos and the white power structure wanted to destroy them, the Brown Berets. 
Three days later, an open letter appeared in the daily press signed by 41 local Hispanics. We can take care of ourselves, they said, with no, quote, self-appointed saviors to come into our county and add to our problems by agitating imagined or real social problems. The letter was signed by eight union leaders, two men from a local LULAC bunch, branch, that's the uh, Hispanic Civil Rights Organization, uh, two members of the town council, the chairman of the county Democrats, and many educators, including Librado Maldonado. It amounted to a broadside of mainstream Hispanic opinion here. But the letter included no signers under the age of 30. At a time when the entire country was splitting across generation gaps, the response to the Brown Berets broke along generational lines. Patsy Madrid, for example, was 28 at the time. She let them use the facilities at the Chicano Center on Chihuahua Hill, which also put on a fundraiser for them. They were just kids, she told me, of no danger to anybody. Fred Baca was, a, was 20, a student here at Western New Mexico University. Quote, they were way ahead of what we were going through, he said recently, and maybe the town was not ready for it. Some of those who signed that open letter, he suggests, were perhaps worried about losing their jobs if they didn't sign. Raul Turrieta was 11. I wanted to be a Brown Beret so bad, he told me. They were our heroes. His conservative Mormon far father, worried that his kids might be infected, took them out of town for a few days. And this is extraordinary. Saul Ramos was only four. From his neighborhood near downtown, he heard distant chants of Chicano power. He went and joined the parade, raising his fist like the other guys were doing. Someone picked him up and gave him his beret. 20 years later, after many protest activities, Saul Ramos said he became a Chicano that day. On December 4th, the berets held a closing rally in Goff Park uh, near uh, downtown. The Daily Press, the next slide, please. The Daily Press ran this photo. Speakers dis dismissed local schools as the most racist in the entire Southwest and local politicians as benditos, sellouts. They left the next day for Las Cruces. Now, the Brown Berets indulged in some hyperbole. How would they know the local schools were the most racist in the Southwest? Had they surveyed all the other school districts in the region? No, they had not. But they raised hard questions and they challenged soft complacencies. Come to me, please. In the tradition of the Brown Berets, in 1985, two local men, Gregorio Mesa and Luis Quinones, started a fortnightly bilingual newspaper, El Reportero, The Reporter. At the turn of the 20th century, Mr. Dooley, a fictional Chicago bartender who commented on events of the time, Mr. Dooley said that a newspaper should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That is what El Reportero did. It annoyed many people and stirred things up. Back to the slides, please. Greg Mesa, M-E-S-A, grew up on an old Grant County tradition now dead of militant labor activism. This bedraggled photograph was taken in 1948 when Greg was 23 on a picket line in Santa Rita. That's Greg on the right. Uh, second from the left is uh, Clinton Jenks, who was one of the main protagonists of that Empire's Inc. strike two years later. His sign says, Greg's sign says, stop acting like Hitler, Kennecott, bargain on a new contract. Greg looks guarded, determined and about to explode. That was often the face he showed the world. He was a paratrooper in Korea and a miner for 22 years, active in the militant local 890 of the steelworkers. On some issues like communism and women's rights, he was conservative. And what could be more red, white, and blue than this? He loved baseball. A catcher and first baseman, he ran like a catcher, but he could hit the ball a mile. 
Perhaps he loved the game in part because the playing field was a true meritocracy. Out there, ethnicity didn't matter so much. The important question was, can you play ball? In the 50s and 60s, it was an arena here where local Mexicans could trounce the white guys as they generally did. That must have felt especially satisfying at that time. Next slide. For years, Greg was a one-man protest movement. He ran for political office and always lost. He feuded bitterly with the Silver City Police Department and filed a lawsuit charging the cops with harassment, illegal surveillance, and death threats because he had sought a grand jury investigation of police misconduct. In 1984, he won an award of $216,000, of which his lawyers got a bit more than half. Greg used some of his, his share to start El Repotero. They needed a fancy computer and printer. And in 1985, that cost about $8,500 the equivalent of about $20,000 today. It's a major investment that only Greg could provide. Luis Quinones was the paper's editor and main writer. Next photo, please. And uh, go back to the slides, if you would. Here is his freshman photo. No, forward, the other direction. There he is. His freshman photo at Western on the right in 1971. He grew up in Bayard, Luis did. His father, a driller, worked at the mines. Luis came from a home with books, magazines, and rears. His father subscribed to the Sporting News out of St. Louis, the venerable Bible of baseball. Luis and his five siblings all went to college. At Cobra High, he was a jock with brains, the high scorer and most valuable player on the basketball team, and a star in baseball as well. In the early 70s, he, like many young people then, went through some large changes. He Hispanicized his name from Luis to Luis and immersed himself in the Chicano assertions of that time. After two years at Western, he transferred to New Mexico State in Las Cruces, where he majored in journalism and Chicano studies, graduating in 1975. In the 80s, he returned to Grant County and wrote a weekly column for the Daily Press, the only Mexican in a sea of whites. Craig Messa liked the column and came to meet him one day. They were very dissimilar people. Of gapped generations at the ages of 60 and 34 with sharp cultural differences. But they were kindred souls up to a point for a while. The first issue of El Repotero appeared on August 9th, 1985. It came out every two weeks in editions of eight to 12 pages with one to four pages in Spanish. Next slide. The only bilingual newspaper in Southwestern New Mexico. The bilingual voice, it says, teachers must be bicultural. Remember, this is in a town that had banned the teaching of Spanish and using Spanish in schools for decades. So this is a real departure from the way things were in the mid 1980s. The usual press run for the paper was about 2000 copies sold by subscription and at convenience stores. Many of those issues went to families with multiple readers. So the total readership was perhaps three or 4,000 people every two weeks. Nobody on the paper got paid. It was all volunteers. The next slide. Among the regular writers were Raimundo Gonzalez, with his column, I'm a Union Man, there you see, and Sam Flores of the Electrical Workers Union, and Arthur Martinez, a PhD political scientist at Western, and some friendly whites, the next, such as Doug Early, Gene Simon, and Sandra Griffin, who all had newspaper experience. That lead article there, Fourth Worker in 10 Months Dies, that's from a series by Sandra Griffin. She was on that beat. That was her beat. We were unfettered by the laws that govern most newspapers, Sandra Griffin told me. We had a really good time. The next, here at the top left, an immigration and naturalization service man is asking a Mayan warrior, have you been here since before January 1st, 1982? 
Uh -huh. The paper was politically liberal and culturally radical. It insisted that Mexicans and their cultures be granted the same respect as their white counterparts. In Grant County, that was a radical proposition. The next slide. As of 1987, the Chamber of Commerce had given its annual Citizen of the Year Award to 37 people, all of them white, every single one. El Repertorio ran that news on its front page, as you see here, above the fold. On the perennial issue of what to call oneself, the paper rejected Hispanic as too vague in general and not suited to Grant County because it didn't imply any Indian heritage. The county had largely been settled by people from Mexico. Instead, the paper preferred Chicano or Mexicano, labels that were more specific, local, and inclusive. Paradoxically, both more specific and more inclusive, but it's true. An editorial by Luis Quinones early in 1987 set the context. In the late 50s and early 60s, he wrote, many overt local discriminations in schools, jobs, restaurants, and swimming pools were abolished, at least officially. Yet, quote, the civil rights movement overlooked Grant County. It basically never arrived. 15 years earlier, the next, the Brown Berets had come and stirred the pot. Really, what has changed in 15 years, he said. We say nothing. More Chicanos have been elected to office, yes, but the real issues have not been addressed. The need to promote cultural respect. Cultural respect. For three and a half years, the Grand County Mexicans had a conspicuous, fearless, or relentless advocate for cultural respect. The next, they could count some milestones in that time. The first building at Western named for a Mexican. The first Hispanic president of the university, the next. And the first Chicano superintendent of Silver, Silver City Schools, the next. Until 1985, only two Mexicans had ever, ever been elected to the school board. And that fall, their candidates swept all four seats. Late in 1988, Luis resigned as editor. He and Greg had been disagreeing about policies with the newspaper. And at 37, Luis wanted to start grad school and get on with his life. The main run of the paper stopped at the end of 1988. Greg revived it occasionally over the next five years in part to support his political career. Saul Ramos was one of the later editors, 20 years after he had marched with the Brown Berets at the age of four. The um, experience stayed with him through his life. And Greg finally won some elections, amazingly enough, to the town council and the county commission. He had not changed, but the paper gave him a platform and the voters had ticked just a few degrees to the left, enough to elect him. Greg died in 2000, 76 years old, I think he was, yes. He had feuded with the daily press, of course, which took its revenge by printing a death notice, but no obituary. Someone of Greg's prominence in the community should have had a full obituary, but this is the Daily Press's last jab at him. The next, Luis got a PhD from New Mexico State and based in Las Cruces, has continued his career as a Chicano educator and activist. Go to me, please. Where we are today, very briefly. Hispanics have much more political power today than 50 years ago in Grant County. Um, they get elected to the town council, the county commission, the school board, other local offices. That's an enormous change from 50 and especially from 100 years ago. On a social level, and here this is just an impression. I've lived here for 12 years now. Came here from Boston in uh, 2008. <clears throat> On a social level, it looks to me as though Hispanics and Anglos interact mainly in schools and jobs and otherwise largely go their separate ways. To the extent that I, after being here for 12 years, can understand a very complicated situation, 
I see a lot of self-segregation today by both groups. People usually want to associate with those who look like them and live like them. This attitude proceeds from positive reasons, not negative ones. It's not mandated by anyone else's rules or law, but a matter of private personal choice, of custom and comfort to stick with what is known and familiar. On this level, it may be understood as an affirmation, freely chosen, of oneself and one's people. Discrimination, on the other hand, is quite different. It has greatly diminished from 50 or 100 years ago. Young people who don't know the relevant history may not see that, but that's true. But discrimination still surely exists, often in more subtle ways. The problem remains white attitudes. Many Anglos still don't grant Hispanics full cultural respect. Back to the slides, please. Professor Arthur Martinez, now 82 years old, you know, uh, there it is, yes, is the grand old man of Hispanic protest in Grant County. Growing up in Holly, Colorado, he and the other Mexican boys would leave school for three months each fall to harvest broom corn. Here is Art, third from the right, 14 years old in 1951, at the harvest, looking quite cool in his sunglasses. Missing three months of school every year, always lagging behind his white classmates, he thought it best to drop out after the 11th grade. I escaped into the military, he said later. After the service, Art went back to school, placing first in his class in junior college, gaining confidence and ambition. At the University of Denver, he was one of five Hispanics in a student body of 5,000. The former dropout earned a PhD at the University of California, Riverside in political science and Latin American studies. Art came to Silver City in 1973, joining the faculty at Western. In Southern California, he had taken part in the marches and uprisings of the 1960s, including the new Chicano movement. Here in Grant County, he intruded that spirit into a rather conservative university administration. Remember, the 60s had not happened here. Among the students, he found about two dozen willing activists, half of whom came from outside Grant County. Inspired by Gandhi, King, and Chavez, his major influences, Art joined the students and others in political protests. Such actions jeopardized his prospects for tenure. That extended process took a decade. Once tenured, he could express himself freely in El Repetero. Describing its publisher, Greg Mesa, he also described himself. Quote, I appreciated his guts, his strength of character, Art recalled. He spoke up when he needed to speak up. In retirement, Art has traveled the world by himself, still an eager student, many miles from harvesting broom corn in Holly. Next, next uh, photograph. Here at the Great Wall of China, in 2015. He said recently, the struggle for saving this county and our country is far from over. The struggle to be the place to live with more equity and fairness for all the people in it is still in front of us this week. It hasn't stopped. In fact, certain things that have come up recently give me proof that people have to remain mucho mas alert, ready, aggressively active, and not limited only to talk, unquote. Back to me, please. And finally, in my research, I've been working on this since 2017, I couldn't find any published books or articles on this subject for Silver City or Grant County or anywhere in New Mexico, which surprised me. I would like to compare the situation in Grant County with the rest of the state. I can't because nothing pertinent and substantial has been published. And friends, that is just absurd. The only comparable situation in this country is Jim Crow segregation in the South, about which there is a vast body of literature, piles and piles of books and articles and dissertations. For New Mexico, my article, in the New Mexico Historical Review last year is the first 
published article on this subject for any part of the state. Cindy Renee Provincio, who grew up in Bayard, graduated from Western. She wrote her master's thesis at Texas Women's University in 2017 about segregation and discrimination in Grant County. And there's a recent book about segregated education now that was published last year by Linda Lopez, an emeritus professor at Western. So what we have are a master's thesis, a book, and one article on this subject for the entire state, and they're all about Grant County. For the rest of the state, there is nothing. This seems to me a major failure by the historians of New Mexico. It's absurd. It's inexplicable. It's baffling. The mistreatment of Hispanics would seem to be a major part of the social history of New Mexico in the 20th century. A shameful, neglected story, <clears throat> but no historians have seriously addressed it. The story needs to be told. Thank you. Wow, that, thank you so much, Mr. Stephen Fox. That was extremely enlightening and moving and horrifying and something that I'm very glad that you were able to share with everyone with us here today. And hopefully everyone that has seen this can spread the word. Um, this, uh, for friends that you may have hoped could have been here but, but couldn't, the video for this will be available on our website um, in a, about a week. But before we go, I want everybody, we have an opportunity for some question and answers. Everyone, don't leave yet. Um, for, um, Mr. Fox will be happy to take your questions. If you see there's a little QA box there on the bottom, it looks like another, um, another dialog box. You want to click on that and it shows all of your questions and I will go through them one at a time and I will bring you on the air. So I'll be able to hear you and you'll be able to ask your questions to Mr. Fox. Um, first up, we have Juan Abeda and he wants to know what is Pueblo Picaris? I don't know if I'm saying that right, but let's get him on the line. Give me one moment here. Okay, Ooh, there's a lot of people. Could you spell that word? I didn't catch it, Aaron. Uh, Pueblo Picaris. Where do you want? Jane, you. Sorry, I'm looking for you one to try and make you one. Uh, P I C A R U S. I don't know anything about that. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't see him. He might have logged off already. Um, well, uh, Juan, I'm sorry. I'll try to come back to you if uh, we are unable. Okay, uh, Stephen Chavera wants to know where is the Mexican town today and does the machinist house still exist? I'm going to bring him on. Hopefully I can find him. And see Stephen. Here we are. Hi, Stephen, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Stephen, uh, will you repeat your question? <laughs> well, wrong, Stephen, this is the other Stephen. And uh, yes, that, that was my question. I was curious to know um, where the, where the uh, Mexican uh, village is now in relation to, you know, geographically speaking, and was curious about the machinist house um, as far as where that is located. And just from a, from a clarification perspective, I think what the other uh, gentleman was asking about was um, Picuris Pueblo, which is P-I-C-U-R-I-S. Um, which is an Indian Pueblo in northern New Mexico. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, I'm just curious, as the director of the Chamber of Commerce and a recent, um, I've moved back to the county, I'm always curious to see where things are now as as they were way back when. My, my parents grew up here yeah. during the time of the presentation and my grandparents as well. And, you know, I'd love to see uh, where that machinist house is, if it still exists and what, uh, 
but if yeah. it's part of the old vanadium that kind of went away. Yes, uh, I can speak to that. Um, both the white area of Santa Rita and the Mexican area no longer exist because Santa Rita, those parts of Santa Rita no longer exist. The land under them became too valuable. The mining company wanted to mine them. So it gradually just nicked away at the, those two communities and they have all disappeared. The town, there's, there's an alumni group of people who grew up there and they call it something like the town from nowhere or the town that no longer exists. They were gobbled up by the mining company. So right. none of them are there. Some of the buildings were moved, that's true. Um, some of them were moved to Silver City uh, when they were about to be swallowed by the mining company, but the towns themselves just disappeared. Great, thank you, sir. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, if I may interject uh, very briefly, I believe that there is a Facebook group um, called Born in Space for Excellent. people that were born in Santa Rita and no longer. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, that might be another resource. Yes. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. And the Lincoln School is still a Grito Head Start. It's been there since 1969. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see some of the original structure. It's greatly changed, of course. It was originally opened in 1915. But, um, and those two places that I mentioned, the, the hut after school hangout, where Mexicans like Lerato Maldonado could not go despite being in the National Honor Society and on the football team, that is now the grinder mill on College Avenue. And you can imagine it's got a big parking lot. You can imagine kids driving in there after school in the 50s, but only white kids, no Mexicans. And as I said, uh, the restaurant with the sign of no Mexicans or dogs allowed, that is now the Billy Casper Center. That used to be a restaurant in the 50s. Uh, short plug, um, you mentioned El Grito Head Start and I just want to remind everybody that in early October, one of our um, bilingual bedtime story hours that we hold for children every other Sunday night at 7 p.m., um, we're going to have two representatives from El Grito um, doing a story in English and Spanish. So if you wanna know more, that might be a good time to ask them as well. Um, Okay, thank you, uh, Stephen Shavira. It was nice speaking to you. And thank next you. we have Eileen Kingsley. And she wants to know, while I can understand how racism, it, how racism was promoted in Grant County by white management, I wonder how much wider the roots of racism. So um, let's bring her on, okay? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Eileen, you're on mute. If you can unmute yourself, please. No, okay. Okay, now I'm oh, unmuted please. now. Hi. Hi. Hello. Okay, hi. Um, so Stephen, like you, I've really been interested in the context of Silver City and Grant County's development within a, the longer development of uh, the Southwest, and in particular, the New Mexico Territory and its relationship to um, developing businesses, to the US Congress, Mexican-American War and the Civil War. And I really wonder, I, mean, I can understand how much the white management for the mines promoted racism in Grant County, but I wonder, whether or not the roots of, of racism here go much deeper than that and, and are still growing. Uh, the first incident that comes to mind that uh, I actually read about, it was an assignment in Steve Fritz, Dr. Fritz's class at WNMU in Southwest history. And it's, it's called the El Paso Salt Wars. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. There's a really long, good article on it, journal article, but um, there was a land grant, a Spanish land grant, that entitled everyone to access the salt there for free. Spanish, Indians, Anglos, everybody. So as what happened with a lot of Hispanic or Mexican then land grants after the Mexican-American War, somehow that community land grant just got lost in the shuffle. So a gringo man came in, 
and apparently bought the property, but he owned it, fenced it, gated it, told everybody they had to pay for it. When the Hispanic residents in El Paso attempted to reason with him, violence broke out. And eventually, the governor of Texas asked for U.S. Army troops to come in. The president said no. Well, a whole troop of vigilantes from Silver City, this is like late 1840s, probably 48 to 1950, but and they went. There was no, one, no, there was no one in Silver City at that time. From this area. There was nobody here. Well, I, I am sure there were residents here. In, in the 1850s, Grant Countyans voted with Tucson to sever the New Mexico territory horizontally and instead of vertically because they did yeah. not want to be associated with the Northern Hispanic New Mexican territory legislature. But the vigilantes, according to the journal article, basically raped, robbed, and destroyed a whole lot of Hispanic property. So when the governor of Texas couldn't get the U.S. Army troops to come in, he called Silver City. Yeah. Um, during the Civil War, um, so Grand Countyans voted overwhelmingly to sever the state and join Tucson businesses. Um, and Tucson really wanted the mines and not be associated with the northern half of the current New state of New Mexico. After that, during the Civil War, a lot of Grant Countyans and Southern New Mexicans residents supported the Confederates. So the Confederates very nearly won the war in New Mexico, if not actually for an Hispanic army hill and a Comanche scout, um, and by birthday, they would not have been stopped. So that's the history context, you know, and actually even going back before that, um, Covey's journal that he kept during the time period when the international line was drawn, he describes how they set up headquarters at the mines, knowing that, that Mangus, Colorado was there. I mean, the commissioner stayed in El Paso, but he sent military to deal with the Apaches and to get them out. So there's the racism against the Apaches, the racism against the Hispanics, racism against Blacks, and, and more recently, the last topper is, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, up until 2016, Silver City was listed as having a chapter of the KKK. Wow. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off real quick okay, and I'd like to my question speak is, more about this later. But I how always... much, right, of a context is there that these roots are really deep-seated here? And I think it's tragic. I really do. But yeah, I've, I've heard stories from local residents about the segregation and about being forced not to speak Spanish. And I'm yeah. a bilingual teacher. I'm an ESL mm -hmm. bilingual teacher. Thank you. The point is well taken. And I, I, I would stress that I'm narrowly focused on Silver City and Grant County from 1870 on, but the history of white mistreatment of other peoples is long and deep and tragic in this state as in most parts of this country. Um, I agree. Uh, I would like to put in a plug for a panel. Uh, there is an adult education group here called the Western Institute for Lifelong Learning, WILL, and WILL, I'm involved in that, is putting on a panel uh, by uh, a webinar again on September 12th with four non-Anglos who have lived here for decades talking about what it has been like to live here. And two of them are people I mentioned in my talk, Luis Quinones and Cindy Renee Provencio. They are going to be representing the Hispanic point of view on that panel. Kyle Johnson is a black man here who has been very active in many uh, political activities and uh, very much the driving force behind our new progressive radio station here, KURU. He's going to be representing a black point of view. And Romain Begay, who is a Zuni Navajo potter and teacher who has lived here since the early 90s. They will all be talking about what it has been like to live here as a member of their particular group. And uh, the moderator is Magdaleno Manzanares. He is a vice president for external affairs at Western New Mexico University. September 12th at noon for about an hour and a half. And it should be very interesting. And you'll notice there are no gringos on that panel or in the moderator. It's just non-gringos talking freely from their own life experience. It should be very interesting. Thank you for that, Mr. Fox. Yes, I know them all. I look forward to hearing that. I, I wasn't aware that it was gonna happen. So 
September 12th, about noon at Will. Yep. Thank you. And uh, about uh, John Sully's role in bringing it here, he is the guy who brought it here, but I have to say it might have arrived here without John Sully because there were other mining towns in northern New Mexico, southern Colorado in that time that were also segregated between Mexicans and whites. So it might have happened here anyway. John Sully just happened to be the guy who did bring it here, but it could have arrived in some other way at some other time at some other place. Well, thank you, Eileen, for some great information and some wonderful and very insightful questions as well. Uh, sorry, we have to move on. We have a lot of people waiting to talk. Thank you. And if you um, have, if anyone, if uh, we don't get to anyone today, please uh, send me an email at education at silvercitymuseum.org. I will pass that along to Stephen um, Fox. And um, let's keep going. Um, let's see who I have. Deborah Dakota wants to know how the Apaches fit into this, if they were a third caste or lumped in with the Mexicans. So that sort of uh, um, goes a little bit along with some of the information that Eileen was just talking about. I'm going to bring her on. Okay, let me find you. Dakota, Deborah. Hi, Deborah, are you there? Hi, thank you for the question. Thank you for the presentation. And really, that is just my question uh, to the extent that Apaches fit into this or had a separate uh, caste in, imposed upon them caste system. And also, I am, I would love to hear again the uh, author and title of the book that you mentioned that has been written on this in Grant County, please. Thank you for the question. Um, there was a lot of intermarriage, of course, between indigenous people and Hispanic people, Mexicans. Um, the Mexicans who moved up from Mexico to help settle Grant County in the mid to late 19th century, they virtually all had some Indian heritage in them. And that remained true here. So a lot of the people who were classified as Mexicans, for example, at Santa Rita, who were consigned to live in Mexican town, most of those people had Indian background and some of them um, more strongly, I mean, in, in ways that were probably visible, but they were probably all just lumped with the Mexicans as being non-whites and inferior and consigned to Mexican town, to the living conditions in Mexican town and to the wages that were paid the laborers because that was what, where all of the Mexicans and indigenous people would have been lumped. It was very hard to rise in the structure there until the unions and the feds got involved. And then lo and behold, all of a sudden, as I said, 58 of the 60 mechanics were Mexican by 1967 after decades when all the mechanics were white. Well, obviously the potential Mexican mechanics were there if the company had been inclined to find and train them and promote them, but it was just, it was the way things were. And uh, it was very hard to break out of that. And it finally happened, as I've said, in the latter half of the 20th century, but it was a slow, laborious process. And and, sorry, Deborah, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And also you mentioned there is a book written by a local academic um, on this topic in Grant County. Yes, Linda C. Linda. Linda Lopez. Okay. Uh, Linda C. Lopez was published last year and it's about segregated education. And she interviewed a lot of people with their memories of what it was like to be in segregated classes and segregated schools. And um, there's a lot of good stuff there. It, it came out after I had finished my research and after my article in the New Mexico Historical Review appeared. So I did not use that book in my research because it wasn't available yet. But um, there are copies, for those of you here in Grant County, there are copies at the Miller Library at Western New Mexico University and at the Silver City Public Library. Um, a lot of good stuff in there. Congratulations to Linda Lopez on that book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. 
And let's see, Claudia Efferdink. How did the strike and making of Salt of the Earth filming impact racial relations in Grant County? So I'm going to bring her on. That question is a little bit longer, but I think I'll let Claudia ask herself. She's, oh, there she is. Hi, Claudia, are you there? Please unmute. Hi, Claudia. Claudia, no? Okay, um, we will come it's back to you then. I can speak to the question. Oh, okay. Yes. The most significant event in Grant County in the 20th century was the Empire Zinc Strike from the fall of 1950 to the spring of 1952, about a year and a half in duration. And it was eventually won, and then it led to this film, Salt of the Earth, a few years later, which was very controversial because it was made by a bunch of Hollywood lefties at the height of the McCarthyism of the 1950s. So the movie got buried. It wasn't shown many places. Uh, it was perhaps shown here at a drive-in back then. Um, but it's, an, it's a major event. It really is uh, on any number of levels. It's too complicated to go into here. As to is its residual effect, I don't know. It stirred things up during the strike and then the movie's appearance stirred things up again. But its long-term impact, it's hard to say because uh, so, as I said, Silver City is still a very segregated place in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was appalling to people who came here, say in the late 60s, not knowing about this, not knowing about what conditions they were going to meet and finding these segregations, uh, the ones that I have mentioned, uh, they were still there and didn't really get abolished until the 70s. And there are residues today in white attitudes, as I've said. Um, the difference is, it seems to me, the kind of resistance that El Repetero represented, those two guys, Greg Mesa, Luis Quinones, that they did that newspaper, and for three and a half years, that's its primary run. Greg, uh, after Luis left the editorship, uh, Greg revised it, or revived it periodically, especially to help his political career. But it's really important time when the paper was at its best, covering the news best, was mid 85 till the end of 88, uh, when Luis Quinones was the editor. That was just extraordinary. And there were demonstrations and protests here in Silver City to a great degree not seen before or since. The, the, the political 60s happened here 20 years later, largely because of that newspaper. Wow. Um, she also asked further in her question if any white women supported the Mexican women who maintained the line when the men were pushed out. And um, how did women's essential role in the strike impact women then and now? It's fascinating. Um, at one point, the men, the, the guys who were working in the mine, the Empire Zinc mine, were legally enjoined from being on a picket line. So what happened was the men stayed home and took care of the kids and the women went on the picket lines. They had not been enjoined from picketing. So they went and picketed. And this is the early 50s, folks, in a traditional Hispanic culture where the roles of men and women are fairly well-defined and one may, might even say too well-defined. So it was an enormous break with the traditional ways of Hispanic families were run here. Um, the residue of it, my understanding is that once the strike was over in 1952, things returned to normal and the men and women returned to their old roles. And I don't know if there was any long-term effect. There are people here who really know way more than I do about the Empire's Inc. strike and they, they could talk to this better than I. Um, there's some good books about it. There was just a, a recent book about uh, Clinton Jenks, the, the fellow who was in that photograph from 1948 with Greg Mesa, who was uh, very important in the strike. Um, uh, but beyond that, I cannot say. I don't really know that much about it. And um, B would also like to know the name of that book. 
that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you mean the one about Clinton Jenks or the one by Not Linda Lopez? Lopez the, the book by Linda Lopez has a very long title, but what it amounts to is a study of segregated schools in the southwestern part of New Mexico. Um, the title goes on and on. It's, it's, it's kind of an unwieldy title, um, but there's a lot of raw material in there because she quotes extensively from the interviews that she did over a very long period, um, 10 years or so, I think it was. Um, so it's a very worthwhile contribution to the literature. It's specifically about segregated education, but it includes a lot of other stuff about how things were unfair for Hispanics in those days, those days being the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, essentially. Um, so there's a lot of good material in there, especially the um, transcripts of interviews with very different people. And they, they tell stories uh, that I've not seen anywhere else. It's a good contribution to the literature. The literature being tiny about this subject in New Mexico. It's odd because Texas and Southern California also had a lot of segregation and discrimination against Hispanics in these years. And there's a robust historical literature about these things in Texas and in Southern California, but hardly anything about New Mexico. It's puzzling. It's a shame. It looks like um, Frances Gonzalez would like to speak as well. Let's see if I can get her on here. Hi, Frances, are you there? Please unmute. Frances? Oh. Well, okay, I'm unmuting. Can you hear me? Hi, nice yes. to you. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Fox, for doing this presentation. Um, I, I, I'm one of the historians um, that actually grew up with a lot of the folks that were in Salt of the Earth. Um, my dad was an old timer from Local 890. So my perspective, you'll find a lot of history in uh, the books written about Apaches. And uh, you'll find a lot of history of the um, For some reason, Frances has muted herself again. I am attempting. Okay, there I am. <laughs> you'll find, sorry, you'll find a lot of these things are so, they just barely, I didn't barely even touch the phone. Uh, what, so anyway, you'll find a lot of the history that you're talking about um, embedded in labor history books and in the Apache culture books and some of the um, Chicano history books. I was one also a student of Dr. Arturo Martinez. Um, ah. I studied them in my political science degree. Mine was in uh, Chicano studies and foreign policy and international law. So Wonderful. mine was a little bit different. But yes. um, so that's, that's where a lot of the history there that you'll find. I'd really like to sometimes see a panel where we can actually, because you also have another labor historian that can talk about segregation and the discrimination here in Grand County too is Dr. Dale Giese. He was one of our history professors. He's retired. He can also talk about the Apache culture as well as uh, the historical culture with the, with the labor unions and, and stuff. And to this day, just to answer your question, Assault to the Earth has, has had a lasting effect. It's 2020. And there's still a lot of comparisons as to um, what happened then and what's happening now. It's become more subtle um, to where, well, there's enough of you in there, so it's okay. But now what's propping up is our us Apaches are finally, a lot of us are finally coming home. A lot of us are really starting to speak out. And it's not just us, it's like Mr. Begay and um, some of the other folks that are here as well. And we're finally letting people know that we're here and it's not okay. 
And so, um, so to let you know, it'd be really great sometime to do a panel with uh, salt of the earth, it's, its effect, but also looking at how labor and you, how labor unions and the company, the different copper companies from mm -hmm. Kennecott, you can even do it from the Empire Zinc, Kennecott, Phelps Dodge, and then the current mm -hmm. company, how they, they've all had comparisons of how they've um, each contributed to the community and how they have also divided the community. Yes. And uh, the way that the economics, then you look at the economic situation, which a lot of people here don't even consider looking at. They always look at the racial part of it. But one of the racial inequalities, as we all know, comes to economics. So one of the biggest things is when you look at the racial economics and the injustice that happens, a lot of folks depend on the copper company, don't go to college, don't go to school, even though they could because they are smart enough. Um, they choose to do that work because it does pay well, the benefits, all of that. That's the economic part that is great about the company. But when copper prices go low or things happen and they have to fur furlough, like also COVID-19, all the different things that have happened. Now there was a newspaper article a couple of weeks ago that uh, by Christmas, they're, they're hoping to open and only bring back 60% of the workforce and 40% will be permanently laid off. Um, so, so you have to look at that. That's been a constant cycle here since Empire Zinc strike. So those are some real comparisons that I can sit down and talk with you about. I've done a lot of research on. I've done a lot of reading over the last 30, 40 years. That's been my thing. I love unions. I am a labor historian. I know a lot. Uh, when you were asking had the had it would it have come anyway? Yes. The Molly Maguires from Colorado a lot of people don't even know about them. They're the ones that actually started the first union in Colorado. They were coal miners and they started out with a lot of you know who Mother Jones is. Um, she's now to this day, they made a magazine out of her, but she was the miners angel and she was a female and they would have brought a lot of that to this area because there was a lot of people from here going up there and on and on. So yeah, there's a whole lot of comparisons. I don't want to take a lot of your time, but anyway, I just wanted to uh, to bring that up up to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm very uh -huh. glad to hear from an old student of Art Martinez's. I spoke to Art Martinez last week, and he's hale and hearty at 82 and still full of beans. Oh, Thank yeah. You for he gave a really good presentation on this issue that you're talking about today, too. Um, last fall and I was hoping he'd have a second part to it and he made down the line. But yeah, I still, uh, oh my God, I love that man and I have so much respect for him because of all the professors at Western, him, Dr. DC, um, uh, Phil Cook, rest in peace, um, were all a part of holding Western to its feet on discrimination to women, people of color, and to supporting Art Martinez to having to get his tenure. There's a whole issue and all that just because he spoke out. And so, and they also, they also attacked Dr. Cook and Dr. DC as well because they supported the Hispanic people, the Hispanic students, and of course, Dr. Martinez. And there's a whole lot of even um, female, uh, you know, sexual discrimination as well. Um, one of my psychology professors went through that same thing way back then too. And I'll tell you, um, Dr. Martinez and Dr. Gisi are two of my favorite people because they would come to the Grand County when we had the big strike in the 80s, when we didn't know if we were going to go back or not. Um, Dr. Martinez spent a lot of time helping us come up with strategies and, and working with the international and finding monies and all sorts of stuff. And Dr. Gisi as well, getting people to come in, figuring out different ways. They're the only two professors to this day that are well looked at in the mining district as well, because they got 
as dirty as we had to get. And they, and Dr. Martinez has my utmost love and respect because of that. Wow. And Dr. Thank Cook you. and Dr. Oh. All right, thank you very much, Francis. Um, we're um, going to have to move on. We have a lot of people still waiting to ask her to ask questions, but I would like to speak to you afterwards and via email about uh, some of the information you brought up and um, our programming here at the museum. If you'll sure, I put my email address on one of my comments. And if you'll email me at education at silvercitymuseum.org, I would love to speak to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Francis. Let's see. We've got a few more people to go. Um, Nancy Cliff asks if El Reportero is available in the archives, if you know. Yes. Yes, there's a, a file of it during Luis Quinones' editorship <clears throat> from August of 1985 through December of 1988. There's a microfilm of that at Miller Library which currently is not available, I suppose, but it's there in the microfilm section. That's where I got those copies of it that I showed in my slides. It came from that microfilm. And then the Silver City Public Library and its treasure room has a bunch of copies from the later period, from the period of January 89 for off and on for about five years. Uh, Greg kept uh, reviving it. And there, so there are additional copies. So between those two places, there's a fairly complete record of that newspaper. And I must say, more needs to be made of it. Uh, classes in local history at Western and in the high school and the Aldo Leopold School should assign students to go look at it. It's the raw material, the immediate reports that make up history. It's newspaper articles from the time. And um, it should be used more and people should know about it more. It's, it's a major milestone in the history of the Hispanic community here, because for those years, especially those three and a half years of 85 through the end of 88, Hispanics had a voice that they had not had before and that they have not had since. It's important. It really created a situation that was overdue, frankly, uh, of consistent, angry Chicano protest here about conditions. There had been protests before, as I said, Art Martinez gets here in the early 70s, and he's at the center of a lot of this stuff, but um, it wasn't as sustained and as widespread as it was in the late 80s because of that newspaper. And it ought to be better appreciated, I think, especially by Grant County Hispanics. Okay. Um, let's see. We have Mary Reagans. I will bring her on, wants to know, um, if the focus on Grant County as to research on this topic is connected to the salt of, to the salt of the earth. Now let me bring Mary and... Hi Mary, are you there? Please. I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, and Alan says hi. Oh, hi honey. Um, so Stephen, thank you for this incredible um, presentation. Uh, um, a, a little bit of anecdotal information about the grinder mill I actually did um, I wrote a historic context for the town of Silver City in 2003 that's uh, post-war oriented. And the grinder mill is actually Silver City's first drive-in eating establishment, and it dates from immediately after the war. That's not related to my question. My question has to do to the notoriety that the Salt of the Earth event um, has. And if yeah. you think as a modern historian, that event has drawn historians to um, Grant County as a point of research that's yes. like your own. And then tied to that, are there other events that we should know about in New Mexico that causes you to question why everybody's focusing on Grant County with this topic? That's a good question. My knowledge of New Mexico history is uh, largely limited to Grant County. There are stories everywhere, but um, I don't know, you know, there are many, not many, there's a half dozen good books about the Empire's Ink Strike and the movie that came of it. Um, it's been well investigated, well written about. Uh, there's always room for more, of course. Uh, just recently, there was a, a new biography of Clinton Jinks, um, a central figure in the strike, maybe not 
absolutely necessary. It, there's some argument about this. Uh, would the strike have happened without Clinton Jenks? And what's interesting is that white people tend to say, no, it wouldn't have happened without him. And Hispanic people tend to say, of course it would have happened without him. You can see a certain ethnic bias in those responses right there. Um, but there are other stories. Uh, but for, for Grant County in the 20th century, the Empire Zinc strike and the, the movie, those are the most important events that I'm aware of for Grant County. As to the rest of the state, I just can't say. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Have a good day. All right. Um, we have another question from Kathy Romero that um, let me bring her on. Let's see. Hi, Kathy, are you there? Oh, yeah. Um, Your first question just says Picturus. I'm not exactly sure if you could uh, no, no, elaborate on your question. Ignore that. I was, I was, uh, ignore that yeah. one. Anyway, so this t question about Tyrone, uh, I imagine it was under the same type of segregation that existed in the county, right? Yes, but it was closed for about 40 years from the 1920s into the 60s. But before that happened, yes, it was also run on a segregated basis. I decided not to go near Tyrone just because it was, it missed that those 40 years there. Uh, it was built up along the same segregated lines in the 19 teens, the same time that Santa Rita and Hurley were built up along those lines. And, and then it just stops in the 20s. Uh, mining is suspended for four decades and then it resumes. It resumes, of course, segregation had been outlawed. So um, I didn't cover it, but there's a real story there. There is, and someone else ought to look at it. I just didn't have room for it in what I was doing. Yeah, I'm interested in it because my grandparents from uh, Zacatecas uh, briefly were there working and then they moved on uh, around the 1920 period. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when it closed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Hi, Stephen, are you there? I am, yes. Oh, nope, the other Stephen, Stephen Shavira. There he is. Yeah, Stephen is here. I'm sorry, I walked away from my phone for a minute. Um, I did have a question, but I think it got answered already um, with respect to um, the conundrum about why there are not very many historical accounts firsthand from this part of the, of the country. Um, I think that um, Francis mentioned it a little bit at the, at the, the, uh, the Apache texts and the different groups, but uh, I'm just curious as to why there were no, um, you know, true Hispanic um, accounts or what, why they weren't motivated to report on that. I think the material is there for those accounts. They need to be written. Uh, they have not been written. I don't know why. Well, as, as I said, you know, my mother and my father were both here um, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. My mother had a lot of those accounts and we listened to stories about them all. Uh, certainly the, the um, salt of the earth days and that, and that strike in that period. Uh, but um, they're, you know, real verbal accounts that go on, they're handed down from generation to generation. So, um, you know, the, the stories are actually going away because generations are going away. Absolutely. One of, one of my best interviews for this project was with Lurvato Maldonado. 
I interviewed him in 2017. His health then declined and he died in January 2018. I feel like I got there just in time. He was in his early 80s, I think, when I talked with him, still quite lucid, but in poor health. And uh, I wish he had lived long enough to see the article in print in the New Mexico Historical Review. My point here is that these memories exist, but they're not written down anywhere. They're just in people's memories, old people. And old people are liable to die and take their stories with them. So I wish there were more, say, graduate students in history and political science and sociology walking around with a digital voice recorder getting these stories recorded because they're going to disappear because they're not written down. They have not been written down. They're just memories in old people. And that work needs to be done and done soon. And I, it just astonishes me that this isn't going on. It would seem an obvious lacuna, an obvious gap in the historical literature that needs to be filled. And grad students are always trying to find a subject for their master's theses and dissertations. And here it is, folks, it's waiting. Get out there and do it. it just, uh, it puzzles me that it's not happening. I agree. Uh, well, thank you, um, Stephen. Nice. Let's see. We might have one more. Um, let's see. We have another from Claudia. Let me see if she's still is up for that. Claudia. No, Claudia. Oh, there she is. Claudia, are you there? Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Nope, sorry. Um, well, what she wants to know is if there is any influence of the 17th century Spanish invasion in New Mexico or Grant County. I don't think so. I don't think anyone got this far. Uh, we were off the beaten track and uh, I don't think so. Really, the history of Grant County starts in the 19th century. There are some, some activity in the early 19th century, maybe. And then Silver City, the county seat, gets going around 1870. And that's where my story begins with the founding of Silver City. Um, I don't know uh, any influence earlier in, in, in the 18th century, but I'm not an expert about New Mexico history, as you can tell. I know about Grant County. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Joe would like to speak really quick. Let me bring her on. Hi, Joe. Uh, you wanted to mention about the museum has a list of relocated houses of relocated houses from Santa Rita. Are you there? Joe? Oh, yeah, it wasn't a question. It was just it was an answer to someone's previous question about what happened to um, basically Santa Rita. It was about Mexican town, but we do have a list of um, supposedly relocated Santa Rita houses and their current addresses uh, uh, that uh, if, if someone wants to uh, get in touch about that, we can certainly get them a copy. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And anybody interested in the building history of, of the town, the book is Built to Last by Susan Berry the former director of the Silver City Museum with Sharman Russell, uh, our most celebrated local book author. It's in its second edition and it's available at the Silver City Museum shop and elsewhere around town. Built to Last by Susan Berry and Sharman Russell. Yes, and if you um, would like to purchase that book online, you can email store at silvercitymuseum.com, sorry, silvercitymuseum.org. And uh, Melody will help you purchase that uh, since we are not open at this particular time, but she'll be happy to help you with that. That store at silvercitymuseum.org. And I think that's just about everything. If we have any more questions, please um, email me at education at silvercitymuseum.org.
I'm going to bring that. Uh, education at silvercitymuseum.org. Um, I want to remind you that this video will be available to view, to view at our website under programs. And um, we'll have that up in probably about a week. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Stephen Fox for joining us again today and giving us all of that very pertinent and interesting information. Um, just blown away by, by the things that we've learned here today. Um, also, if you can, please donate. Uh, there will be a, when we end this, you should get a link to a survey that if you will please take, it'll pop up in your browser. Um, please give us that feedback, really helps us know what we're doing wrong, what we're doing right, what I can improve on, and um, also maybe ideas that you might have for the future. And I'm very happy to hear those. Um, also, our YouTube channel, you want to sign up that. Uh, join our Facebook, go to our website, and uh, join us next Sunday for Rattle Still Skin with Kristen Warnack from Virus Theater and Xochil Matazuma. And she is a local teacher, and they will be doing our uh, bi weekly uh, bi bilingual story time, bedtime stories for children. So please come see that. And if you have um, any questions about upcoming events, you can see them on the website as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us and for hanging around and for your great stories, your, your wonderful questions, and a final thank you to Dr. Stephen Fox. We're very blessed and, and happy to have been able to have you with us today. So everyone, have a good day. Email if you have any questions. And bye, Stephen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.